Hey, everybody, before we get into the show, I just want to let you know about our sponsors. It's a film called Sir John A. and the Curse of the Annie Quench. It's about two brothers that saved the town of Kingston from demons by staying drunk. It stars John Dunsworth from Trailer Park Boys, Spenny from Kenny vs. Spenny, and the Deaner from FUBAR. You can get it on Vimeo On Demand right now for only $2.99, and it's also streaming on Amazon Prime. Check out CurseTheAnnieQuench.com. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Kind of a DeLorean? Welcome to the Raiders of the Lost Commentary Podcast. Welcome to Jurassic Park. The unofficial commentary for your favorite... Get to the chopper! ...and not-so-favorite films. With the famous comedian, Arnold Braunschweiger. Starring your hosts, Adam and Matt. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Start your movie... In three, two, one. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Today on the show, I have a very special guest, uh, filmmaker Robert Tunnell, and we're talking about his film, Feast of the Seven Fishes. Robert, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, so I came across your movie through a, a mutual friend, and uh, you know, I, I checked it out, and I was very interested to just learn about the making of the film. I will say we normally uh, have a lot of indie filmmaker guests on the podcast, so I think you surpassed definitely the star power and budget amount for a film we've covered on the podcast, so there's always a first with a lot of things. Um, I just want to maybe just start off and just... You know, you can let people know uh, how you got your start in the business and, and uh, you know, where you came up. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, that is a that is a story that's rather epic, and I don't know um, how much of that you want to endure. Uh, I was just uh, – I grew up primarily in uh, north central West Virginia where the, where, where Feast of Seven Fishes takes place. Um I uh, had a really great childhood, really great parents, really great siblings, really great friends. I just uh, always loved movies and um, became quite captivated. Uh, I knew I wanted to be a director from the time I was maybe six or seven, which is kind of crazy. Um, and I was very fortunate that one of my two heroes, one of them was uh, – or people you know that I was really enamored by. One was Terrence Fisher, the the British film – director who did a lot of films for hammer films like horror of dracula and, and this guy was a huge influence on me and uh the other was george a romero uh, in night of the living dead um and uh george i was lucky where i lived is about 80 miles south or where i grew up was about 80 80 90 miles south of pittsburgh i did a fanzine i kind of leveraged that my way in to get close with george and with tom savini and with um and with george's dp mike gornick in particular and uh, they got me work. You know, I started as a kid. I was like 18 or 19, I think. On I got to act. I was an extra on Night Riders. Then I was a PA for about six months on Creep Show, which was oh wow, that's awesome, life, life changing. And uh, George kind of encouraged me to to go to LA to go to film school, which I ultimately did in um, in 1983. And where I was, um, you know, I kind of. I, you know, I was, I, I took school very seriously, but I, you know, I got to work on some like B movies with, you know, with my, my good friend, Fred Olin Ray, which was great. You know, we were just, you talk about indie and underground, my God, you know, um, and getting to work with people like John Carradine and you know, it was just, it was a wonderful time. But at the same time, it was the beginning of the music video, um, revolution and it was the wild west, you know, and there was just an incredible amount of opportunity because there just weren't enough bodies to fill the roles. And inside of a couple of years, you know, I was just banging out tons of music videos and, and graduated from film school and, um, did a couple of little films with Fred. And then I produced a film called surf Nazis must die, uh, which, uh, trauma picked up and which did like huge business and, so yeah, so you said the title, that. and I was like, "That sounds like a trauma movie." <laughs> uh, God, it was the trauma movie. Yeah, you know, like you're, you know, we were like on Entertainment Tonight. They talked about it on the Today Show. You know, it was a big deal, and it it did really, really well. And, oh, that's great, man. And so I don't know, man. I mean, it was just such a crazy life, and it, it ultimately, you know, I want, I just, I couldn't. It took me forever to get to direct, but finally, um, um, French Canadian producer named Richard Goudreau from uh, Melanie Productions in Montreal, Quebec, um, was interested in a project I had called Kids at the Round Table, and that was the first feature that I directed. Um, 
And there was a whole bunch of adventures in between. I'm really glossing over a whole bunch of stuff that I don't know if it's interesting, but, but it happened. Uh, and, um, I did a series of films, um, you know, living in Montreal and my brother eventually ended up up there with me. He's my producer and we have a company together and we, but he worked with Richard on things like lay boys, you know, the hockey oh, yeah. comedy. Um, and so we just, we had a really great run up there and then the business model kind of changed and, uh, you know, I don't know, the early 2K years I was jumped into, uh, you know, I just wasn't getting the directing gigs and I kind of fell into writing some comic books and reinvigorated my career and that got more screenwriting. And then I, my commercial company took off and I was just doing tons and tons the last 10, 15 years, just tons and tons of music videos and commercials and documentaries and producing features. And I mean, it, it, the list is, it's ridiculous. You know, I produced for, um, for Josh Stewart. Um, you know, Josh, who's like, he stars in the collector movies and we did, um, we did a movie called the hunted, um, which was primarily produced by my friends, Pat Rosati and Brett Forbes. And then, uh, Josh and my brother and I did a film that came out last year called back fork which was like an opiate drug drama, Appalachian drug drama, and then followed that up with Beast of the Seven Fish. We're just busy. I guess we're, so. We're really, uh, really, really busy. So uh, as fascinating as all that is and as much time as I could spend talking about all those projects, the goal of this is to do a deep dive into uh, Feast of the Seven Fishes, uh, which is out now on iTunes, Amazon, I believe, as well, and all streaming services. Um so bring me through, obviously you talk about being a writer and so like, when did you get the idea for this? When did you know you wanted to make this? Like, when did you kind of just start the beginnings of putting something like this together? Well, you know, I tend to, um, things tend to percolate with me for a really long time. I, I tend to second guess the material or maybe, you know, I have an idea. A lot of times the idea will be like a, you know, a lightning bolt. But then it'll just sort of smolder, you know, for years, if not decades. And um, I had uh, I had written this uh, screenplay that got picked up, and it was a big kind of sprawling horror screenplay, which is actually finally shooting next year after like 15 years, which is funny. Um, and so I kind of in the back of my mind knew that I wanted to do something with this. And I actually pitched it to the executive at the time, the studio, and he loved it. But my manager thought it was a horrible idea. He didn't want me to do it. He's like, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're a horror guy. Now you want to do this and nobody's going to let you direct and blah, blah. And I had made, I'd made a little private documentary with my grandfather and my great uncles, you know, cooking in the nineties. So I, you know, I was, sort of obsessed with saving the tradition or, or documenting it. And um, so I, you know, for about six months, I didn't do anything. And then on my first comic book or first graphic novel, a book called The Black Forest came out from Image Comics and it, and it, and it you know, it sold out like in just a few weeks and it, and it got really good reviews. And, and I had another one we were doing and um, I met a young artist and he's like, I'd really like to work with you. And I was really interested at the at the time with online comics and um, I want to do an online comic. And so we kind of said, well, let's do this as a daily comic strip. We'll just throw it out there. And I remember, cause I came home, I told my wa- my wife, you know, Hey, I'm going to do this. And she's like, Oh, I'm so glad it's not hard. It's a romantic comedy. It'll be awesome. <laughs> she goes, who's putting it out image. And I go, no. And she's like, dark horse. And I'm like, no. And she goes, well, who's going to put it out? I go, oh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to put it out on the, internet and give it away for free and she goes like what are you an idiot <laughs> and i was like no man i'm like a drug dealer you know first taste is for free then yeah they- <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, it didn't quite work out that way but you know and 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 so we did and then we the artist the uh, I, I lost the artist and i got an, another like amazing artist alex Saviak came in and i couldn't believe it because he was you know doing web of the spider-man and doing the he was doing spider-man in the daily comics and he's oh, like great He's like, I love this. I want to do this with you. And so we finished it. And I, after about four months, I discovered that it was building this kind of fan base, you know? So when I pulled it all together, I'm like, I want to do a book. We're going to collect the story and we'll do a cookbook. We'll, we'll have my wife, who's an incredible cook. We'll do a cookbook and kind of a history thing. And we'll make a collectible book. And I went to Image 
you know, which was my publisher. And um, my the guy that generally handled me, Eric Stevenson, was like, I love it. I think we should do it. But I got nuked by someone else at the company, which is their right. I wasn't mad at anybody. Um, but none of the publishers I had relationships with had any interest in it. They were like, they just didn't understand or they didn't want to do it or they couldn't, whatever. Cause comics is a tough racket. Yeah. So no doubt. I went to my brother and I go, I think, th- I think they're messing up. I think that this is something. And we kind of, you know, he scraped up the money and we formed Allegheny image factory and, and we put out the book. So we, we did the book, we made a really nice package of the book, um, launched kind of, we did everything. Um, got a publicist, you know, did it all. And it, and it started like taking off. We were like, I remember my first book signing was places like Youngstown, Ohio and bookstores wouldn't take us like Barnes and Noble wouldn't take us. Nobody wanted us cause they don't want like one, a publisher with one book. But then I would go, I remember I went to my first book signing was in an Italian market cause the bookstore didn't want us. It was in Youngstown, <laughs> Ohio. I did a radio and a TV appearance really early in the morning. And the first book signing, I sold 145 books in 45 minutes. Wow. Because people loved to say, we're Italians. We went where there were Italian Americans. Right. Youngstown's um, known for sort of an Italian community, if I'm not mistaken. Youngstown's, oh yeah, and where I am from is very Italian. And um, anyway, long story short, you know, we kind of limped along. And I remember, I think it was in May of that year, on a Sunday night, I get this email. And I knew the I knew who the person was that sent it. I had actually met her once, but from San Diego Comic Con. And I opened the email, and she said, "Congratulations, you've been nominated for an Eisner Award for Best Graphic Album Reprint." I mean, this is insane. Oh wow, right? that's amazing, yeah. man! It was totally amazing. But you know, you're going up against like you know Charles Burns, and I mean, just like <laughs> only yeah. it was it was ridiculous, you know. And to be nominated for that was just <laughs> absurd. And uh, so then I decided to adapt it, you know, as a screenplay, which I had not done yet. And um, I had just written, um, I had just adapted for anonymous content. I had adapted um, an Anthony Bourdain novel. Um, And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I can leverage that, you know. Um, And people loved the script, but they didn't want me. Uh, even my manager at the time, she said, you know, no one's going to let you direct this. You know, you're not, you, you, no one's going to let you direct anything. Um, it's like, just cause but, track record, just cause you normally did horror or, uh, in that well, normally I was doing children's films, quite frankly. And then the, the comic books were hard. No one would let me do horror. Look, it's all stupid. Okay? Right. I mean, I literally just had a, a horror project optioned and the guy actually said to me, you know, you're never going to get to direct any of these cause you're a rom-com guy now. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Really? That's so you know, weird. I, yeah. No, I, I, I worry about that myself too. Just like, uh, like I make shorts and stuff and I've made some other things, but I'm like, do it. It's like, is it, am I going one lane too much or am I going too many lanes at the same time? You know, you're not going to fix this. Mindset. Probably not. <laughs> so, you know what I do is I like, I beat on the door and if they don't let me in, I go, I go over somewhere and I find a reasonable looking hole in the wall and I just start kicking until I batter my way in. And I want him to just put on my tombstone. He was too stupid to quit. You know, I'm just <laughs> not. Gonna... And I will say this, and and I, Adam, I mean this sincerely. And I've been saying this for years. I, I teach, by the way. Actually, I do. I love. I I don't. I can't do it full time, but I love teaching film. And I, and I'm the director of, uh, ironically, the George Romero filmmaking program outside of Pittsburgh. And I spend as much time as I can up there. And I love. I love it. And I love teaching and I love the facility and I miss George, you know, I miss him and I get to see Savini a lot. You know, it's a good experience. And, um, but I would always say to students, I make no distinction between a two minute movie and a two hour movie. And people used to say, yeah, well, you can't get a two hour movie anymore. Well, now I can. And I still say the same thing, you know, work begets work doing, you know, practicing your craft is doing push ups. I'm not curing cancer here. Um, I'm just a cra- I'm trying to be a good craftsperson, trying to be a good storyteller. Um, and I'm going to take every opportunity that presents itself. And I, you know, work that I would have turned down in the nineties, uh, I'm happy to take and I wrap my arms around it and it just makes me stronger, you know, whether yeah. it's, and, and quite frankly, it's far more lucrative than movies to go do 
you know, somebody pays you, hey, will you make a dramatic film encouraging hospital employees to not spread Ebola? <laughs> right. <laughs> you put enough zeros on the check. Exactly. Yeah. Hell yeah, and, dude. <laughs> uh, and then I and then I and then I have found a way to fall in love with that and to actually take pride in doing a good job. You know, I just can't afford a film student's uh, integrity. You know, mm, like yeah. student, and I'll never do this or that. And it's like, shut up. Yeah, no, yeah. I've kind of, I've always been like that, but I definitely do have friends in the business that they're they're above doing certain things. But I'm like, yeah, like I run a production company here too, and I'm just like, yeah, whatever, whatever it is, let's do it, let's make it happen. Well, yeah, and get something out of it, you know, and try things. And I mean, you know, for years, there people couldn't figure out. Like, I would take any. You know, because we have a, our company. I mean, we do stuff all over the U.S., but you know, primarily we'll do things. You know, in kind of a triangle around like Pittsburgh to kind of w- Richmond, Virginia. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and been through West Virginia, and we, of course, we do friends and family for West Virginia. We always take care of our people here because we love it here. But like, I would take things for restaurants, and and they would say, you know, "Why are you doing this? You know, how are you giving us this? Why are you doing it?" And I was just like, oh, no, I like you. I'll do it. But secretly, I wanted to learn how to shoot food because I knew someday I was going to make this movie. And I wanted to be a good food shooter. Right. That's a skill. <laughs> I tell you, I shoot a lot of food, actually. And it's a skill. <laughs> it, it, and, and not always. I don't, don't you find it's not always intuitive? No. You know, like, you know, you think like that you want that steak sizzling off the pan. And then you, over time, you discover that the steak looks better after it's after it's rested for about an hour and doesn't look like a bloody mess, you know? Well, there's um, that too, yeah. And there's just tricks and little things and then, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, so I don't know. I just um, – no, I, mean, I like that. I like that. But uh, so you get nominated for this Eisner Award, which is huge, and a, a huge congratulations on that nomination. Uh, did you win the award? I don't follow the Eisner mm. Awards as closely uh, as no. I – no. Oh, no. No, it was a really tough year. I'm trying to remember what I was – what, what we were up against, because I know, I think, I think Charles Burns won it that year. Um, for a wonderful, I'm trying to remember the name of the graphic novel because I loved it. And I can't think, cause I think at the time, I think David Fincher had optioned it and I, and I knew David, I actually produced for David. Um, actually we won like three MTV awards when we did Paul Abdul straight up back in the day. Oh, that's great. But I think David had, done, I'm trying to remember what else it was. It might've been diary of a wimpy kid. Oh, okay. It was one of them. I don't remember. Uh, and that's enough. terrible. Fair enough. Um, you know, I've actually really tried to get to where, like, I just, I am super grateful and I love winning a war. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, but at the same time, I've tried to learn to kind of compartmentalize that because I think it's, you know, it's like the little match girl. You remember that story, the little match girl, every time she would light the match and she would try to, she would see this magical world and then she ran out of matches. Yeah. I'm just, I'm trying not to light too many matches and get too excited about those things. I mean, and and also I really feel like, you know, there's so many people that work with you and collaborate with you and bring so much to the project. And it, the more and more I get to do this, the less and less I think it's about me. And um That's more a good and more attitude to have. Well, you know, it just you if you don't think that's the truth, you're kinda lying to yourself. Yeah. Eh? Um I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying and i i look at it as more like the journey and and less about the the thing that comes out and i think of it like like being on set and making stuff is the most fun i'll ever have and i think less of i look forward less to when something comes out and being in a theater watching it or being wherever and watching it with people than i do like i can't wait to go be on set and make something so yeah. And, you know, it's funny in, in general, I'm sort of, I've gotten to this thing and I, you know, when you're a kid and you, you, you read or you see something about performance art and you think it's, you it just seems dumb and weird and stupid to you. And then like, but as stupid you get, to you though, that's right. But as you get older, I mean, I'm starting to sort of see the creation of something as the actual art, as much as the end product. So for me, the experience of creating stuff in and of itself is sort of becoming some sort of a performance piece. Um, <laughs> and you know what I mean? I don't know if that makes any sense, but no, I, yeah, I, I get but, what you're saying. Yeah. Like it, it, it's easy to, it's easy to like talk shit and be like, that's stupid. 
But it's another thing to be like, well, let's let's actually kind of look into what they're trying to do here. You know, I don't. That's I I, I think maybe I'm misinterpreting what you're saying. <laughs> like a lot of times, probably lecture and just did. No, you're exactly saying it. But I, I but also you know. Like I'll, I'll be lecturing students and they're inevitably sooner or later. I don't know why it seems like people will start bitching about Andy Warhol. And I'm like, you know, I never bitched about him, but I didn't really care. Right. Totally get it now. I think it's incredible what he did and important what he did. But it took, you know, decades for me to wrap my head around it or to even be in a position to appreciate it. Right. And, you know, the, for him, the reaction of the audience, I think, was art as much as anything. Yeah, um, I was lucky. My girlfriend's an art history major, so like we went to like a, they had a thing in Toronto. They had all this stuff one time, a special exhibition. She sort of broke it down for me, and I was able to like understand it and appreciate it because yeah, like for me, like born in '86, I look at it and I'm like, I don't get it. But there's a lot of stuff in the art world, first glance, you don't get. And I mean, there's stuff that grabs you right away, but like. Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Well, it's all about context, right? I mean, and that's it. You know, you if you can't contextualize Warhol, I'm not sure you can appreciate him. And, and you know, we all look now, like if you look at Van Gogh, you go to a Van Gogh, like I went to a Van Gogh exhibit, you know, a long, long time ago. I've been there the, in uh, Amsterdam almost a year ago, like now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I was at the one in, I think it was 88 or 89 at the Met, you know, in New York. Oh, and you, I, I went to Amsterdam. Well, I saw you – know, you see a starry night for the first time and it's bigger than I thought it was going to be and, I, and it floored me. And you're looking at all this art and you're just overwhelmed and you're trying to wrap your head around the fact that the guy couldn't sell anything. Yeah. His brother was and, a bit of a dick. I don't know. But, yeah, <laughs> but, he, but you know, he, he, it, it's easy to be baffled out of context. Exactly, yeah. You know, and, uh, and because it's such a visceral – response you know i remember i had this i I took like i wanted when i was in college i took art and music of prish because i wanted to not be a philistine you know i wanted i thought it would make me a better filmmaker and and i don't know that made me a better filmmaker but it made me more accomplished filmmaker or more prepared but i remember my teacher was this really old woman in music of prish and she talked about how when ravel you know wrote and first performed bolero you know she actually got to see him conduct i guess bolero and like people like rioted like they went crazy because of this music, you know, you was the, you know, you can't do music like that. Right. Uh, I don't know, man, I, I really went off. We went Sorry. off on a tangent. That's okay. Um, I, I can, don't get to really, I don't get to sit and talk to about film and all this stuff a lot to people because I'm so busy. So fair enough, yeah. man. Um, but, but anyways, bring me from when, uh, you know, it goes from the graphic novel to a screenplay to where you're like, you know, you're, I, I don't know if you shop the screenplay around or, or if. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, we almost shot at one point. I mean, money was spent and we lost our gap financing. Um, and it was right before the, uh, the collapse in 2008. Oh, wow. And we didn't, you know, we wondered what was going on because all of a sudden, you know, you can't do anything without the gap, right? You know, you needed that that, that money to bridge you between your tax credit monies and your, you know, your initial equity investment and, and it collapsed. And I thought, man, you know, so now this isn't happening. I was completely devastated and, um, kind of, you know, in a bad place for a while. And the only, frankly, the only thing that was keeping me going was, well, some of the stuff I had written was, you know, was getting like optioned or whatever, or re-optioned, or I would get a little rewrite thing or something, but I couldn't get anything to direct. And, um, you know, at one point you look up and you're like, I haven't directed a movie in eight years. What am I, you know, I'm done. And um, they would, you know, people were trying to get me to sell it or, you know, look, you can make this money, you know, and you got to make a house payment. You got two little kids. You um, and I was just like, you know what? No, I'm not going to sell it. I'm going to hang out. I'm going to hang on. And at some point then, I don't know when, around then, maybe 2010, I started getting asked to direct small projects, you know, a little like 
will you do a early social media campaign or will you do a little commercial for this or will you do that? You know, whatever. I don't know what they were because I used to direct commercials in LA, you know, in the nineties when you could make all kinds of money. And, um, and so I just, you know, woke, one day woke up and it's like 2013 and I'm making really good money and, um, I'm really happy and, uh, I'm doing things like creating little web series and doing stuff. And I realized at some point I didn't give a shit if I ever made a feature again. Really? Yeah. Because I was actually filmmaking and, you know, I'm not going to sit and be all sentimental about physical film. I love shooting film. I love the properties of film, but man, I never in my life could make anything look the way I wanted it to. Feast of the Seven Fishes, I love the way it looks. If you don't like the movie, if there's something wrong with it, it is no one's fault but mine because it's precisely the film I set out to make. And the only reason that's even possible, the only reason I could literally shoot a film in my grandparents' house where it took place was digital. And so all of a sudden, you know, I'm directing 30, 40, 80 projects a year. And I'm not saying no to anything, you know. Um, because you're able to shoot it digital or just when yeah, that transition just, happened? I'm, yeah. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, I, I'm, and I'm learning these new things. And I had friends in LA because I, you know, I had relocated to the East and it hurt me. I mean, I took a beating in the beginning because I left LA and I left Montreal and, you know, I thought I had it all worked out. <laughs> um, but I just left a few years too early. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, I had friends in LA going, we don't know what, what's happening. You know, that we don't, we don't recognize the business. And I was actually riding that wave of change. I was, I didn't know, you know, one of my, one of my friends told me on the phone one night, he goes, you know, you're a disruptor. And I'm like, <laughs> really? I'm just, just trying to, you know, I remember I was, he said it to other people too. And I mean, one time I met Jimmy Sangster, you know, who, was this British screenwriter who wrote a bunch of the Hammer films, the horror films that I love in the 50s and 60s. And I was just gushing to him, you know, what I love about this film and that film and how much it meant to me. And he finally looked at me and he goes, that's wonderful. But, you know, I was just trying to pay the rent. And, now, you know, <laughs> um, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Yeah. You know, I was just rent. And at the moment that I just finally no longer gave a shit, that's when everything changed. That's interesting. And, you know what? I When I went to film school, that's just as sort of the digital sort of revolution was just taking off. Like the PD, PD-150 was just out, and then the red one was just coming out right as we were graduating. And like there's two schools sort of in the film school, essentially, just people being like, you know, it, it'll never take over. The red, all the what they're promising, it's a myth. It's never going to happen. It like the camera is just the body. You're buying a piece of metal. There's nothing inside. Like it was the conspiracy theories around it in film school were actually kind of kind of wild. But uh, we knew somebody that bought one in Toronto early on, and then we were able to shoot something on it like early, early, like build like five, I think it was, like of the camera. So. Yeah, look, I I embraced it. I shot film in film school, and I I did like it, but it costs like an arm and a leg to shoot like you know sixty seconds or something, and you have no control of it after. Whereas when we filmed with digital or the red or whatever, we could mess with it, we could play with it, we could do all this crazy stuff with it. So yeah, I was, I love it. I own I own like a red now, and I'm like I love it. I'm shooting on it all the time. I just. I just want to tell my stories, you know? Exactly. I mean, exactly. And, and look, it, listen, I, you know, and I'm like, believe me, let me be a cautionary tale for people to not do stupid things like I did. I mean, if you had come to me like in 1995 when my first feature came out, I was in, it was in competition, the Kinderfest of Berlin, you know, and you're just, and it's making all this money and you're like, you know, there's big checks in the mailbox and, you know, the, the, you've got like Amblin and all these companies are getting a hold of you about coming to work and direct to Disney and do all these things. And you just think, you know, it's everything. If someone had brought me the opportunity to do a comic book at that time, I would have told him to just piss off. Really? I'm a movie director. What a moron. <laughs> what a moron, you know, work, just work. Um, I like that advice. Um, and I want to get into some of that 
on, on something on that topic a little later in the show. But uh, I am interested to talk about, um, you were talking about financing with the film. And I, I was curious to know, like, if you got financing through sort of independent investors, if you pitched the movie, and, and I know you talked about gap financing a lot, and you had, like, um, tax credits. So I if if you're comfortable with it, I, I was curious if you sure. knew about sure. any financing. Like, did you attach talent beforehand? No, no. Uh, actually, what happened when it finally came around? I was actually in pre-production on on Back Fork. Okay. And uh, we were doing this. Jeff and I were doing this film. My brother Jeff. We were doing this film with Josh Stewart. Um, and you know, we had AJ cook from criminal minds and David Selby, you know, Falcon crest, dark. I mean, a wonderful cast. Um, and we were really excited to do it. I mean, it's a true indie, you know, it's, it's just, it was, it was, it's a really strong, dark little film and I'm really glad we got to do it. And I, and you know, and at the time, you know, I was like, you know, my brother and I doing a big commercial campaign shooting in Virginia. Like I'm in a big one. You know, and we'd just done a big one out in Seattle and L.A. And we're doing, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm I like I I'm trying to develop a, a permaculture farm operation and on my out in out in the country on this property I have. And I was renovating an old house my wife can found and loved and we moved into. And it's like we're living like in the money pit. And, you know, and I was, just happy. you know, I'm like, I'm doing all this stuff. And and then um, my longtime friend and and occasional, you know, collaborator, uh, producer, uh, and one of our best friends, a guy named John Michaels and John has been just neck deep in film finance for 35 years. And he introduced us to a Canadian gentleman named Scott Whitty, um, who is, a, a awesome guy. And Scott, uh, came in and, and brought certain equity pieces and he and John, found the additional equity pieces. Um, and we used at the time, West Virginia had a, a great tax credit, which unfortunately and ill advisedly has been taken away from us, which is a shame. It's cost us two movies here, maybe three now. Um, and, uh, the pieces fell into place and Scott was just fearless. And Scott said, we're going, you're shoot. And I was a little nervous cause you know, I've had stuff shut down before and, what happened though that really sent it over the edge? I remember, you know, we started shooting. I started shooting advanced second unit for snow and for Christmas in December of, of uh, seventeen. You know, and then we went. I think the first day of shooting was was January third or fourth. I think I can't I can't remember. I'm terrible. Uh, in 2018. Um, but, you know, so we were already sort of shooting. But, you know, I, as late as Thanksgiving, I was like, is this really going to happen? I mean, and I was simultaneously making with, I was working with students at the Romero thing on one of the artists in residence projects that I do. And Tom Savini and I were doing this thing. And George's uh, um, daughter, uh, Tina, we were doing this thing that I had come up with called Flickr, which is this kind of silent movie web ser series that uh, Bloody Disgusting ended up putting out. It was a little bite-sized episodes, like a silent movie. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I oh, actually... Uh... Like, cause they do their streaming channel now. I actually, a short of mine got picked up for that streaming channel. Well, and I'm trying to do that and I'm really, I was having fun. There were just things I wanted to try to do. And, um, so they, we got a casting director. I'm trying to remember, I think Josh's manager, Josh helped me. We got a good, we got Brandon Henry Rodriguez, who's a tremendous young casting director and a tremendous person and a really good friend now. Sent him the scripting cause I want to cast this movie. And, you know, you have your dream cast, but you're not – I never dreamt I would get this cast. Yeah, and like I, your cast is phenomenal. Like, you know, to have that many names and like – it's not just like – there are people like, oh, I recognize their face. But there are people with like like a list of credits that are like, wow, you know? Well, God, Madison, what? She's starring in – Jumanji and Annabelle and Goosebumps and, you know, I mean, and I was like, oh, my God, you know, or Skylar, which, you know, Skylar is just blowing up. Even Andrew Schultz, who I wanted to stand up comic in the film. And now he's got his big Netflix special. He's exactly, just yeah. phenomenal. Um, but I remember when I first started thinking, oh, shit, maybe this is going to do OK. 
was my casting director called me because I had to stay here. I didn't even go to L.A. John and Scott would do would be there and then they would kind of go through the they would watch. And I don't like to sit through casting. I prefer to do callbacks. I won't sit for initial. I just you know, I'm back here doing location scouting and storyboarding and I'm trying to finish the Flickr web series. You know, I'm just working like a maniac. And my son was very ill at the time, was in the hospital. It was real scary. And um, I heard from my casting director and he said that one of the, one of the agencies said, like, this is the best script we've had in years. Wow. And, and when I first thought maybe, you know, I knew who Josh Hellman was. Yeah, um, an X-Men. Yeah. And, but I knew him actually from, from uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Okay, yeah. You know, and he's such a striking character in that. And, um, and they go, he wants to read for it, Brandon said, but he turns everything down. You know, he's not going to do it. And I saw his audition and it blew me away as Juke. And, um, he told him on the way out of the door, he goes, yeah, this is my movie. It will be mine. So he was he like uh, kind of like the first domino that started pushing all the other for, dominoes sort of, or? For me, he was. Yeah. Um, and that's the one I remember going, oh, wow. Because that character was super important to me. Really? Uh, How, yeah. For, for what reason? Um, Juke is, to me, is the character I most identify with uh, because he's cursed with self-awareness. Mm. And, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's bad when you're the person who can sit and see everybody else messing up and see how things, you know, he can see five chess moves ahead, but he can't get a date. He right. can see, no, he's socially awkward, but he's brilliant. And I based him on a few people, include, including myself, except for the brilliant part. But I knew this guy, <laughs> he was a biker, biker dude. And he worked with this guy that was a friend of my dad who would work on our cars because we were, you know, we, our cars were always jacked up when we were like teenagers. And he was real quiet, you know, like a grease monkey, real long hair and a beard and soft-spoken gentle giant. And I remember though, you would go in and he'd be like reading Siddhartha. That's why I made the Siddhartha joke in the film. He'd read philosophy and things like that and be real quiet. But one, one time I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and I thought I was about to get my ass beat. And suddenly he was there and I saw a side of him I had not seen. And this guy could, you know, kill you. Jeez. And I loved him. Um, and he unfortunately died young and uh, as did another. He's a composite. It's a composite character. Um, and so he was just critical to me because he's, he's the voice of the film. He's, he's trying to make everyone understand, you know. And, um, and I – you know, they just they started falling into place, but I was having a really hard time getting um, finding someone I wanted as the grandfather because oh, okay. my grand very specific, and I, I had video, I had all these things I wanted them to get from this character because my grandfather was a real character. And then they they brought a couple people, and I was like, oh, you know, this is, could be interesting, and. You know, and I remember, like, I love Frank Vincent, character actor Frank. I was like, that guy would have been great. And I just kept saying, no, 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 no to him. And Nani was a very important character for me because my great grandmother, who I was basing her on, I thought was just beautiful. At 95, I thought she was gorgeous. And I wanted a beautiful woman, you know, even though she had to be old. And so I think everybody was getting frustrated with me because Skyler was in and Madison was in and then Addison Timlin, who's absolutely incredible actress, was in. And um, shit, even Joey was in. Really? And Joey turned the – Joey Pants turned the movie down. And then I was on the set of that web thing, you know, that little horror thing, you know, surrounded by film students and having fun. And my phone rang and I didn't recognize the number and it was Joey. Really? And I, I didn't understand why he called me, you know? And he said, you know, I turned your movie down. And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, I want to talk to you. <laughs> we talked about Calamari for 45 minutes. And he's like, all right, I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know? And it was like. He just wanted to vet you to make sure you're like, uh, uh, you were like legit or. You know, I, I don't speak Joey. I don't know. He just, he does his thing. You know, he's just, he's an incredible actor and he just, 
did his thing, you know, and uh, that conversation would have been real short with me because yeah. he would have been like talking about calamari. I'm like, well, I had a shellfish allergy for the first 30 years <laughs> of my life. And then it would have been click. He's not in my movie. Damn it. I shouldn't have made that joke yeah. about him liking steak in the matrix. Yeah. Well, he, uh, he, he, we just had a lot of shared experience in, in some, in some areas and, and that went well. And that certainly helped me because when people knew that someone of his stature wanted to do it, you know, you, it was like, but I've never had a film that was so easy to get people. I mean, I've always been able to work with some really good actors. I mean, I mean, yeah. Okay. I directed Ryan Gosling, but he was just a kid, you know, he wasn't Ryan Gosling yet. You know, I had Burt Reynolds, I had Malcolm McDowell, I had Joe Mantegna, I had Ben Gazar. I mean, I got to direct some wonderful people, Louise Fletcher. Although Louisa's son's one of my best friends. I think she just did it because she like wanted to take care of me. But, but you know he, what? Ryan Gosling grew up in the same town, town as I, I did. did he? He's a great guy. Yeah. Great, I heard great he's kid. nice. Yeah. He's a very nice and it, his mom's a wonderful person. And yeah. I mean, sometimes the good guys win. Um, but in this instance, like people were just signing up and I'm like, and I, and I was feeling insecure. I was like, but are they going to be like, but why, you know, where's he been? What's he been doing? And they would go, man, you won all these awards. You did all this stuff. We feel comfortable. And no one seemed to care that no one had trusted me in like 15 years. They just, no one cared. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So and, it was sort um, of your own ego fighting against you in that sense. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's just, we're painters with these incredibly expensive canvases and we take stuff personal. And a lot of times it's just not personal. It's just, it's driven by insecurity and there's just a whole bunch of reasons why shit's messed up and it just is what it is. We're not going to fix this, Adam. We're not going to fix this. We're not going to fix fear. Um, we're not going to fix the approach to filmmaking that can be best be likened to a mutual mutual fund, the mutual fundification of the film business. We're going to try to diversify risk. <laughs> you know, if you can't leave our testicles in a jar of water by the bed. I mean, we're not going to fix that. And we're not going to get the lawyers out of this. No. So, you know, I can, I can whine about it or I can keep punching and I'm just going to keep punching, you know? Um, but the. So once you, but like, once you attach all these types of names to like, do you got to go back to like your investors and be like, look, we have all these people. We might need nope. a little more investment nope. here or. Nope. It was favored nations. We said, this is what it is. Do you want to do it? Oh, really? So, so scale, yep. like they just, no, 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 it wasn't that it's not that low budge, but no, but it was, this is it. This is what we can pay. What do you want to do? And for all the names, you know, they were all in favored nations. No one got a, no one got a sweetheart deal. Everyone got the same thing that were the stars. Cause I just never knew that I was going to go eight, nine people deep that, that strong of a cast. Yeah. You know, who the hell knew? But I remember when the pieces really fell in for me because I was getting nervous and we were, cl we were closing in on Christmas and I didn't have grandpa and I didn't have Nani, you know, who plays grandpa Johnny's mom and my casting director, you know, God love him. Who's so patient with me. And he just starts sending me pictures. <laughs> you know, he's just like, look at these people. Look. And all of a sudden I saw Paul Ben Victor who was not as old as my grandfather would have been at the time. And Paul does not have a full head of hair like my grandfather. Did. <laughs> and I just went, Oh my God, it's him. Yeah. Eh? And there was some sort of miscommunication. I can't remember what it was, but I think Paul like didn't, I had to get on the phone with him and you know, it's funny. He called me last night and he's like, man, people are just stopping me. They're calling me. They're, they, they love this movie. They love what I did. He goes, I'm so excited. And he got to play, you know, it was a comedic role. He's an amazing character actor. You know, he's just, he's an amazing human being, an amazing character actor. But then when I saw Lynn Cohen and then, because it, back in the day, you knew you have fantasies. It's like, what if I got Sophia Loren? You yeah. know, what if, I, and, um, I even really, honestly, with the Canadian connection there briefly, when she worked for Cronenberg, you know, I thought about Barbara Steele. And she doesn't want to work anymore. But I was like, she's amazing looking. Um, but when I saw Lynn Cohen, I just went, oh, my God. And we got on the phone and I said, she goes, what do you want with this old woman? You know, and I'm like, 
I think you're goddamn gorgeous and sexy. And she's like, oh, I want to work with you. <laughs> and, uh, and we just loved each other. And she was so sweet. Like, she would call my mom. You know, they became friends. And, <laughs> and we, we lost her earlier this year, which was absolutely just heartbreaking. Yeah. And she, was, she was just amazing. Amazing. I know I'm saying this over and over again, but, you know, they just they, – they were just such an incredible group of, of actors. I can imagine. And, like, it, But, like, walking into, like, you know, a day on set like that and you have all those people – on set interacting with each other like how do you approach something like that as a director like you know well i believe in controlling expectations i think managing expectations is like is like critical to everything okay when you're doing a commercial you better be managing the client's expectations if you have a restaurant you better be managing your your attending you know always being aware and managing the response and i well, one, you know, I was such a control freak. I mean, for every one of the actors they got, you know, I made mixtapes of the kids, you know, because what the hell do they know about the MTV generation? They know nothing about it. Right. You weren't even born. Okay. I'm making them lists of music videos and playlists and I'm sending them shitty TV commercials from local West Virginia television from 1983. We're, I mean, I'm sending them books, pictures, yearbook things. I mean, as much material as I could home movies in my family. And, and then we're having long conversations, you know, like, like Andrew Schultz was in Israel and we're Skyping and we're, we're riffing. I was like, I want you to do some jokes. I went and he, and he did, you know, we would go back and forth and we would make each other laugh. And then he would say, what if I said this, you know, big fat, red, fat, big fat guy in a red suit, you know? And, um, and so we, and we, when they got, when they got here, we had gift baskets made up with like the graphic novel and local foods. And, you know, we did little cooking lessons and things. I mean, we got everybody invested and we made them a part of the community. And then we did things like on the weekends, we would take them out and we'd have these big kind of family style dinners. And my wife, or my wife, my wife would show up with a basket of this food we have here called pepperoni rolls and sure she would make pasta or something. And they loved it. You know, they're like, this is like the most fun show we've ever been on. That goes and, a long way, I'm sure, right? Especially when they all kind of maybe agree to not take what they maybe normally take pay wise. Right. But if it's like sort of like a, it is like going to camp or something like a family sort of event. It, it was. And they just, they bonded. I mean, I've had multiple actors tell me it was the most fun they ever had. And my whole community, everybody I grew up with, all the politicians, the cities, the businesses, people went crazy supporting this thing. And I mean, listen, it, we could have pulled it off anywhere. I mean, I don't want to make it sound like I didn't go out there with, you know, $250,000 and my hand out. It wasn't like that. I mean, you know, we paid our way. But there was a level of commitment and support that we got that it blew, like the Hollywood people couldn't believe it. Like we did the big church scene, you know, they do a midnight mass mm -hmm. and my brother and I, we were like frat boys, you know, we were like just idiot kids like in the movie, you know? And, you know, look, you can pay something for extras. You know, we don't have, these films don't have a budget for 150, 200 extras and asking them to sit in a church for nine, 10 hours. Right. No, that's not a thing. And my one producer, John was just losing his mind. He said, we're going to be so screwed. And I said, John, if they don't show, if we don't get anybody, I will shoot 10 people in a row and I will digitally multiply them through the whole thing. I know how to do this. And I was fully prepared to do it had I had to, but I knew I wouldn't have to. And when he threw open the doors of the church and saw 150 people sitting there, fully dressed like they were going to midnight mass, he's like, I, I, he goes, I've never seen anything like this. That's and great, they, man. And they stayed to the bitter end. I mean, that's the kind of people we grew up with. That's what our community's like. I mean, it was, you know, I can't, I don't know how you put a price tag on that. No. And what does it mean to you, like, to be able to shoot something like this? That it's kind of, I, I could be pontificating a bit here, but like, it feels a bit like a personal story in a way, but to be able to shoot that in your hometown. Um, surreal. I, out of, out of body experience. Uh, sometimes I feel like there's something, you know, like the ghosts of, of a, tons of immigrant people are making this happen. And I'm just like sort of sitting there, you know, yelling cut. I mean, <laughs> um, no, there was a responsibility 
to a, a story that's been underserved or, or neglected. Um, particularly in this country that, you know, when we, when, when a group of working people no longer have use and communities fall on hard times, kind of get rust belty, we tend to write them off. Yeah. eh? Even though, you know, these people won us two world wars. I mean, did the guys that went and fought in world war two were heroes? Hell yes, they were. You know who else was a hero? My grandfather wouldn't let go because they sent him 700 feet underground every day where his cousin was killed right next to him. Jeez. His father died from it, and his father-in-law died from it. You know, and their voices need to be heard, and not by stupid one-note uh, portraits of Appalachia, which are quite frankly offensive. Yeah, eh? no, you know? I, I get that. Like, look, I, I, we have a bit of the Rust Belt extends up to Hamilton, at least, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yes. And uh, no, I, I get that. And uh, I, although I don't have any kind of interesting cultural background uh, like that. But uh, yeah, no, I get that sentiment for sure. Um, Can I, do you mind Adam, if, I, if I just but, you know, when you're talking about cast, I never get the chance to do this. OK. And, and with your permission. Of course. I, I, I would like to point out that I had, uh, in addition to my LA casting, I had a wonderful um, casting director in Pittsburgh, um, and uh, Donna just she nailed. Anyway, she you know I would send her on these hunts, and um, I was so particular because I thought you know there were it was important to me fifteen, sixteen, seventeen characters down the line had to be super specific. And quite frankly, I've watched films fall apart. And, 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 you know, and I say this with love, you know, shooting movies in the 90s in Montreal under some of the tax credit things, you know, you, you know, you're in a province that only has 600,000 people where English is the primary language and you have to cast from there and you bring in a Malcolm McDowell and you've maybe got a young kid on their first movie that only has two lines, but they're getting, there's the potential for them to be get blown off the screen. Right. right. Well, that's happening all over now. Now it's not just a regional little thing like we'd said in Montreal where you were trying to, you know, deal with tax credits and things. It's everywhere is having this problem. So, you know, they're going to Salt Lake City to make a Hallmark Christmas movie. And that guy, seven people down from whatever TV actor they got to star in it, can't hold, you know, they can't hold the water. Yeah. I mean, this is the real thing. So I was like terrified. I'm like, you know, if I put the wrong person across from, you know, from Joey Pants or the wrong person across from Paul or Lynn, and they're going to cruise our, and Ray Abruzzo, my God, he'll knock you off the screen. And so, I you mean, know, I was really, really hyper vigilant. And I cannot believe what we were able to find in that secondary cast, whether it was someone like Jessica Darrow, it was her first movie. And I saw she was great, by the her way, her audition. <laughs> oh, my God. And and I said to her, I, called, I said, look, you're just, but you're too good looking. So we're going to have to frump you up a bit, you know, because, uh, no one's going to believe you're going to, for two seconds, put up with it, with Andrew, with Angelo, <laughs> the character Angelo, uh, Alan Williamson, who plays the part of Prentice. And, you know, and honestly, if there was a part I would have phoned in, it would have been that when I could have gone for the very just stereotypical, somebody trying to do a James Spader eighties knockoff, <laughs> just a pretty face. And this guy showed up and at that point, you know, he's waiting in, here's this, you know, young actor. He'd done some work on the TV show turn and some commercials and things. And he comes in. The first thing he's got to do is do the fight scene with Skyler. And after the first take, I looked over at him and I went, holy shit, you came to work. (laughs) And, you know, we've become friendly or, or, you know, David Captain Calloway, you know, who plays the, the, the mean bouncer at the strip club. I mean, you know, he didn't need to do this movie. This guy works. He's in green book. I mean, this guy works all the time and he kind of, you know, he, suddenly he's there and he's bringing this other thing. And, you know, and then people, you know, like my old fraternity brother and friend Porter Stiles playing himself at the bar, I knew he was going to be okay. But one by one, you know, we just went and found exceptional people to, to plug, to plug each hole. Um, and, and one of the last holes, by the way, was, was, was uncle Carmine was Ray Abruzzo. And I had to get on the phone and beg him. And he's like, I don't know. It's not that much to do. And I said, you don't understand. This character is more than you think. 
And I started telling him, you know, my uncle, he was drafted by the NFL and he was a boxer and blah, blah, blah. And then Ray came and God, I'm so glad he did because he just, he gets so many laughs in the film and he went and took things for himself. And he and Paul and Joe, have known each other for 30 years. Right. Right. So that was just like, you know. I was curious to know, just you cast this movie, you know, you get this big cast and obviously there's a few people that you know, must work well for the role, for the place and the time. But like, are you particular about accents and stuff like that? Because I, I definitely pick up on your Virginia accent and like, do you nitpick about stuff like that? Like when I hear you say Montreal, like I hear it and I'm like, he's from the States. I know like here we say Montreal, like, you know, or Toronto instead of Toronto. Do you nitpick right, well, about I, stuff like that? I, or? I, I, say toronto i say to to yeah <laughs> T dot. yeah um you know I, I tend to wherever i am i tend to do a bit of a um i tend to mimic naturally i can't help it like if i stay somewhere for a week i, I pick up the accent okay um, but where my family my grandfather did not have like he had a weird mix of a southern and a pittsburgh accent and paul does it perfectly you know obviously joey and ray it, it just doesn't bother me okay you know, there are things that bother me, but, you know, things that bother me include when I watch a commercial where somebody's fly fishing and almost every time I see it, these people have no idea how to fly fish and it's just right. a fan. And, you know, I took a beat a lot in the nineties. It was, re I would go in and loop performances just to get, you know, for Oop to become out. Right. And it was, and, and you say, you know, and I, there's nothing pejorative about it, man. Dude, I love Canada. And I particularly love Quebec and I love my friends and I love the people I worked with and I wouldn't trade that experience for a million dollars. You know, business wise, it could be a problem because it became hyper specific. Yeah. And, you know, I find when people are really good actors, I become so mesmerized that I just can't get caught up in it. You know, I, I'm like, I would... Uh, on very rare occasions, I've had a few people say something about the accents, but mostly th that is drowned out by the hundreds and hundreds of messages and or in the reviews or whatever that just rave about these performances. Yeah. Um, and honestly, some of the things in Italian speak, my uncles would say very similar maybe to what Joey or, or, um, or Ray would say. Yeah, they would, have, they would have had a bit of that. Um, when I'm here for any length of time, I mean, definitely, you know, the the we're, I'm 11 miles south of the Mason Dixon line, man. But it is Dixie, and it does come creeping in. <laughs> um, but and you know, in America, it's very interesting. Like about roughly every 40 miles, accents change. Like as you go south, I've noticed that. Yeah, traveling. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's very very interesting. What you know, um, so uh, you know, it, it's just I don't know what you do. Fair enough. You know, yeah, do, fair do, enough. Do, do, because the alternative would have say to Joey and to Ray to stay home. Right. Yeah. And uh, no way, just not going to do it. But it is we, it, we're a very it's a very interesting place here. It is um, there's a, a definite clashing of, of, of accents, and um, so we worked hard on stuff like yins and stuff that people say this kind of Pittsburgh light sort of a sort of an accent, and um, we don't get a lot of pushback about it. Well, that's good. No, just because look like for being Canadian, anytime someone portrays a Canadian in a film. I'm like, you're not from here. You're not from here. You, you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? So there are, and I, and I, and I, I've definitely interacted with and, and met a lot of different people from, from the sort of like Eastern sort of state side. And I, I can pick out pretty quickly, like, oh, you're from at least this area. I, I can pick out like three states you might be from. So. And then there's weird things, you know, there's a part in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia that part of their accent sounds Canadian. It's, but which it's all Elizabethan English. You know? Yeah. It's all yeah. That, which is very, very interesting. No. Um, 
it's those you know, small for, things, I, but like, look, I think that again, like that's nitpicky and, and that's like, I guess what we do as like filmmakers or artists, right. We nitpick certain things, but I, I guess it would be a hard thing to say to, you know, someone like Joey to just be like, actually, uh, if you could say, uh, cold like this instead, <laughs> Well, you think about it in the Matrix. Where did that accent come from? Mm, now we're getting real deep. <laughs> no, but think about it. Was he programmed to do that? I mean, where does the you know in in Bad Boys? You know, where do they live in Miami? Yeah, right. I'm, some guy from you know from from Jersey City. Where, where was? Oh no, I think Joey was from Hoboken. So wait, now now he l- became a police captain. I I don't think so. Right, right. You know, I I don't know, but I think it. You know. No one thought too hard about Connery in uh, The Hunt for Rod October either, so. God, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, anyways, I, I'm sure, like, working with all these people is, is amazing. Um, but I wonder if you could just, like, bring me through, like, you know, maybe a harder day working with some of them. Just, like, were there days where it's just, like, hey, we're not getting it? And then how how do you approach giving, you know, someone like Joey or anyone else, like, direction to get it to where you need it to be? Um, we, I, I think all of that happens in prep. We spent a significant amount of time on the phone and bonding and sharing stories. And in the case like with Joey, I had three secrets that I gave him. Um, and I kept one until the day before the show. I'm not going to repeat it here, but I knew something about my uncle. And when, as I unfolded those to Joey and he finally goes, I know what everything is now. Um, I wanted a collaborative atmosphere. I wanted an improvisational atmosphere. I chose in this film, finally, I'm, I'm, I used to want to make the actors work to my camera. Now I use my camera to follow my actors to see what they're going to do. Um, I, I was, you know, we're pretty close with Blake Edwards and I did this interview one time with Blake and. And he would talk about that, how he just finally, he just learned that the best thing he could do when working with great talent was to let them do their thing. Um, and you figure out in the, in the wake of that, the great thing, how best to cover it. So, you know, we had made a lot of our decisions before we ever walked in. And of course, when I wrote the script, I didn't know I was going to really shoot it in the house where in my grandparents' house. So like coverage and stuff, I knew what I was, you know what I mean? Like I came in, it was like, well, of course they're coming in this door and this, they're going to hit the chair because that's what happens. And right. You know, I did like things. that gag in the film, it, it, but it was just a lot. It's just being observational. Uh, we never, we just never had that day. I, I'm not going to lie to you. We didn't, we didn't have that day. Um, it was the smoothest, happiest thing I've ever been on. And Man, I've been on that's great. Yeah. And that's always well, nice to hear. And, but I'm also like sort of mildly jealous, but yeah. <laughs> well, you know, again, when they know what they're doing, let them do it. And, and yeah. no one more so than Skylar Gisondo. Skylar's a robot. Skylar would break Stanley Kubrick because Kubrick could make him do 80 takes to try to break him down and it'll never happen. He'd just do the same thing for 80 takes. The kid's an automaton. He's made his decisions. Now, Madison, she may go different places. I mean, and Addison Timlin, Addison doesn't even want to rehearse. Like one time I said, like, I don't even know how you do this. Should we sit in there chewing gum? She's like, and I'll be like, okay, you ready? She's like, wait a minute, take out her gum. I'll say action. And she bursts into tears and carries on. And at one point I'm like, how do you do that? She goes, I cry recreationally. (laughs) (laughs) Um, That's great. And like, I'm sure like trying to find those ebbs and flows of like some people need to be built up and need that rehearsal and then other people can just jump in, I guess, doing all that prep work. Sorry, you find out those little quirks and gotchas. Well, here's the thing. I mean, this is the business now and they know that they, they, these people have all of these people work all the time. Now, maybe not the second tier cast, although some of them like Alan and and David absolutely do. They have no illusions. They know there's not going to be any time. If I had three times the budget, quite frankly, we wouldn't have had a whole day. Nobody wants to spend any money to give you rehearsal time. They don't want to pay actors to come in to rehearse. They don't want, nobody wants to do that if they had the money. And 
So they know they got to come in and get it done. Yeah. And then the other thing is I think everybody's working in TV now to an extent. So, you know, they're used to walking in, you know, doing seven, eight, nine, ten pages a day. Uh, this is what they do. And they're pros and they, they're prepped. Um, they're just – They're ready. I mean, they're just ready. And and if you're ready, you know, as the filmmaker, if you're ready and you – and particularly, look, it's – I think there is something somewhat easier when you were also the screenwriter because there's no fat. You know what I mean? You've already yeah. made decisions, but you make all these – you know, you – where you need to do things, I think, is you say, hey, look, before we do this scene, you know, before we come in there that day, I want you to make sure that you have, I don't know, you know, shelled a shrimp or whatever it was that had to happen. So we got to get out in front of that. And so you give them the information they need to know how to do that. And, the, you know, and then when they come in to do it, you're not sitting there, you know, screwing around forever and I'm not being insecure about it. Um, Does I being just, an I, educator sort of help with, with that or? Like, I think being an educator has just frankly made me a better person. <laughs> okay, that's good. I like that. Uh, um, in that, you know, look, I probably shouldn't give away my superpower is that I, I teach to make sure that I maintain an edge on my co co uh, competitors. You know, I'm I got that vibe in film school a lot. <laughs> constantly I didn't know that. And I use it for workforce development. I mean, I, I a lot of my former students worked on the film not because they were cheap. Right. And partly because they were loyal, but mainly because they were good. Uh Jason Walker, who shot second unit, because the DP Jamie Thompson and I go back thirty years very close. He's incredible. Yeah, I, I did like the look of the film. I, I liked just that consistency you guys had throughout it, and it did look good. Well, we were trying to go for an 8 millimeter, which I think was the LA Times picked up on it, you know, that we were doing, you know, Kodachrome for the interior, the warm stuff, and then a cool blue ectochrome for the outside, like 1970s Super 8 film. But then Jason Walker, who uh, is was a student of mine, a protege who has been shooting with me now for about nine years, and is just he's just always put his whole life is just making images. That's all he wants to do. And he shot, you know, 19 days of second unit with me. In addition to running second camera with Jamie and Jamie's like, I love this guy because he's making me look good. You know, all of the food close ups, all of those things that you don't have time to do during the scenes Jason was doing. Um, and. Uh, I mean, we you know, I, I very much sort of modularly approached the film and I took the things that I knew I wanted to be you know, detail oriented and, and iconic and specific to the food in particular. And he and I, you know, took weeks, you know, and, and went and did that stuff. That's and, great. Uh, and we did crazy things on this, just that we've gotten good at doing. I mean, you know, even if you'd handed me a hundred period cars, who's going to move them around? Right. Who's, you know, so we bought, you know, 1970s matchbox cars and I shot them on green screens. And then me and my guys, we would shrink them down and put them in scenes. Nobody knows. All that's they great. know is You know cars. what? That's a, uh, that's a great effect. It worked. <laughs> you know, it really worked. Um, I mean, I think we only had to have something like 10 or 12 functional actual picture cars that were in stuff and everything else is a toy. That's interesting, man. That's cool. Um, wow. I could talk about VFX for actually a long time and how you pulled that off, but I won't there's keep you forever. Five uh, VFX shots in the film. There's what? Sorry. I said there are 305 visual effects shots in the film. There are more visual effects shots in this film than in my first four films combined. And my first four films were about Merlin and Excalibur, uh, included the Frankenstein monster and Dracula and the mummy uh, an airplane that almost crashes and a ghost story movie. And all of those together didn't have as many effects as Feast of the Subfishes. Wow. That's kind of funny. <laughs> um, well, if we're on like that topic, we're going into post-production. I wondered if you could just bring me through post-production a bit quickly, you know, just talking about editing the film. Did you have to go back for any kind of, you know, 
retakes or anything like that or just bring me through a bit of post not retakes um but there were there were the the script was very specific on montage sequences and very specific about things that had to occur that we knew had to occur uh particularly with the food and so while we were shooting i mean we were still shooting even as they were doing the sound design, I was still going, I, I still would say, oh my God, I've still got to get this close up, you know, of a, of a calamari. I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever it was. I mean, we would just take time to do different things. And, um, no, in post, uh, Aaron Shelton, who edited the film, um, did not come on as the editor. He actually even acts in the film just cause he's funny. Um, I brought him in, he, we, he started about, I think, about a week after we wrapped shooting principal. And um, I had him do a rough assembly. You know, and then I went in, I just went in every day and just, we we just bashed it out. And then, you know, my, a really good friend of mine, Jim Haygood, um, who was the, I go back a long time with him, Jim, like, was the editor of, you know, Fight Club and Pirates of the Caribbean. And I would call him and he would look at things and kind of say, you know, what do you think? And I was really, I remember it was funny. I was worried the sequence where Skylar tells Maddie what the seven fishes are and, and it gets really crazy with mixed media because I love bringing mixed media into film. And I knew I wanted to do this sequence, but I didn't quite know what to do. And I kept calling Jim and, you know, seeing what he thought. And finally Jim said, you don't, what you want is permission. You don't want me to tell you how to do it. You want permission to do it. I'm giving you permission. <laughs> don't be a baby. And I died and I said to Aaron, okay, do this. And, uh, I, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, I wanted to have recipes in it and I wanted to have, you know, like a fumetti. I had all these ideas and then I just started making stuff and then Aaron and I would make stuff and, and then some of the other people working for us, some of our other effects people would make things and, you know, and then once it's one of those things, like once I found the way in to that sequence, I, I knew what decisions to make, if that, if that right. makes any sense. No, yeah. and I guess it's like you're following your intuition and and what your feelings were towards it. So I'm I'm guessing just by what you're saying, you're heavily involved in the editing process. Like, absolutely. Yeah, and absolutely. is that important to you? Like music, and like, is it important to you to be heavily involved in the editing? Like, short of actually editing it yourself, or I'm a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you I'm never wanted to learn how the buttons, what the buttons do, or oh, I know how. I mean, I know how. I just. I need a little bit of perspective and the editor gives me perspective. And also, you know, the editor, they, they, they're good. Aaron's a great editor. Um, you know, I worked, I did a lot of pictures with Gaetan Yuat, uh, from Montreal, uh, who cut, you know, the red violin and, and, and just a wonderful friend and a, and a incredible editor. I mean, I didn't just sit there and go now do this. I mean, right, I, right. You know, yeah. I need a monkey there. <laughs> I need, I need a collaborator. I need a, I need somebody to punch back. And, um, and that, you know, I, that's really important to me. No. And then look, we work in a collaborative medium, right? So. Oh, if you're listen, if you're not listening to your people, there's a time and a place like giving me a suggestion on set, quite frankly, is not a good idea. Uh, giving me a suggestion in the morning before, um, but, you know, I had someone do that this week and I felt bad because it, at the end of the day, in a really rough moment and someone, this one person just would not stop all day long throwing out suggestions when I'm trying to focus on really, it's a very, it's a effects heavy music video. And I finally just kind of F-bombed it and was like, you got to get away from me. I don't need your help. You know what I mean? Like, don't do it now in that moment, because at that moment, once I'm on the set, I've made the decisions. You know what I mean? I want to hear the actors push back in that, but I want somebody to come and say, what if you would come over here and do it? Shut up. Yeah. But then once the footage is in the can, shutting down, then that is ego. If you shut down and you don't want to listen to people who just want to express ideas in prep, that's ego. That's insecurity. And like I always say, you give me a good idea, of course I'm going to take it. I'm going to get credit for it anyway. Yeah, exactly. Right? But there's a time but, and place. But there's a time and a place. And I really, it's not good to do it. For me, at the one time, and, I'm, and I don't think I'm anywhere near a prima donna, but that 
you will that that I, I can't tolerate. But in the editing room, swing away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. On set, it can be kind of disruptive too, right? I've definitely dealt with that Not before, cool. and it sends a bad message to the talent. Exactly. Yeah. And this person the other day actually started giving some notes to the talent, and I bit my tongue because under COVID, you know, we were everybody was working just it just. If I'd gone over and followed my instinct, it would have, you know, I would have just looked like a bully and I didn't want to do that. Yeah, it is a tough and a fine line to walk. Like, yeah, I, I have some stories. I won't get into them. But, uh, um, OK, so post goes well. You pull off a ton of VFX shots that weren't that noticeable. Uh, I think a few car shots. That's the only t- thing that I, I really noticed. Um, what's like distribution plan going in what's your marketing strategy like did you have anything set up in advance are you thinking festival to circuit or are you just think what what what's the thoughts going in you know the timing to get it done for a variety of reasons and i wanted matt mariano once we hired him to do the score and we got into work around him and there were a lot of things happening and quite honestly bad things were happening in hollywood as we were finishing um i mean we we lost a studio deal to be honest with you um and I won't get into the particulars, but we did not lose the deal. Nothing to do with the film and everything to do with business between big companies. Right. Um, you know, I, I maintain my focus on getting it done and doing the things I had to do. And, you know, it just, the process played out, you know, the way that it played out. And when we, you know, Feast is, I think, Feast suffers a little bit because I think some people go in and they think it's going to be some sort of Hallmark Christmas movie and it's the anti-Hallmark movie. And not that there's anything wrong with those, by the way. I only mean anti literally in the sense that it is the opposite of that. Right. I, I want people to go to this movie and go, you know what? Christmas doesn't have to be art decorated by Martha Stewart. I don't have – nobody – you know, hardly anybody in this movie talks about like giving a present, a yeah. material – of that crap it's all about shared experience um so i think that you know there was a not quite sure what to do with it initially and you know the audience is telling them now because the audience just they love this film and um it you know and the one time it finally went into a festival it wasn't getting into festival wasn't even getting into the food section of the berlin festival which i just found bizarre but i even had someone had an agent tell me one time stop saying this is a pro-immigrant film and I'm like, are you insane? You you don't understand that. You do not see that this is a pro-immigrant film. I can't help you then. If you don't know that. Well, yeah, because that, their idea of pro-immigrant had to be, I don't know what they had to think. But I'm like, you know, when they put my great-grandmother on a boat with her name pinned on her shirt at 14 years of age with no adult supervision, I shudder to think what she experienced. Yeah. Across the Atlantic. This is a film about people that absolutely have experienced prejudice and and you know class imbalance and being taken advantage of by you know corporate interests all of those things and they've triumphed anyway um but you know people aren't again remember we said earlier about they just they had they're unable unable to contextualize things Mm. um they don't they're not students of history or whatever and you know so that was a bit frustrating for me and then when they finally put us in an academy sanctioned festival at heartland we won Oh, that's great. <laughs> we won audience award for best film over the big studio picture over, you know what I mean? Over the earnest, all of which I lo- look, I love film, man. I love, I love, oh, here he comes again. Hey, hold on a sec. It's all good. Go, go, go. I got no time right now. We'll do that later. Okay. Go. Sorry. I hope you can cut that. Yeah, it's all good. I'll, I'll edit it all together. You know, but you know what though? You're you're talking about just the audience of the film and all that. To me, like, like, like I'm not Italian. I've got sort of just mixed up background. But for me, it was just like a window into a world that I I, I wanted to learn about, and I I like that as a cinema experience often enough. So like, and I and I can know by like friends that are Italian and, and all that that I I. To me, it's like a you're you have a niche audience for this, and that's a good thing about it. And it's by you, you know what I mean, by them for you or 
vice versa? I think that <clears throat> in pursuit of the specific, you you eventually find the universal. Mm. Okay, and maybe that sounds silly or highfalutin, and I don't mean it to be at all. I think it's actually a pretty simple concept. Um, you know, there's nothing worse when I watch so I, it's just difficult for me to watch films that are generic. You know, as a kid, I had a lot of problems with American television. Um, and I'm not saying there wasn't anything that was good. And did I occasionally like some things? But eventually, you know, I became sort of acutely aware that one at the time, you know, it wasn't doing sort of epic storytelling. It wasn't any sort of, you know, serialized approach to anything. It was just, it was one and done every episode, you know, the $6 million man was going to fight Bigfoot and the next week, you know, something else was going to happen. And you were, and I remember being very hungry for some sort of continuity and some sense of a bigger universe. You know, I remember in comics becoming excited when I realized that there had was this whole backstory to Superman and Batman and, you know, that the justice society predated the justice league. And I wanted all of these, you know, these universes to come together. I mean, fanboys were way out in front of all this, uh, and girls, okay, we're way out in front of it, you know, long before it hit the popular consciousness, I think, in, in a big sense. Um, but when I watch a really wonderful specific film, like uh, Bill Forsythe's Local Hero, which is one of my all-time favorite films, and when you, you just know, in, in just from the way it captures the mundane life of a, of a remote Scottish fishing village on, on, on the ocean, it it becomes you're transported yeah and you know and and you and you see you 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 see that you know and i i i'm not saying that you can make a great movie if you're a bad filmmaker and a bad writer who's just but you know a whole lot about growing potatoes but there will be some elements that'll work because you know a lot about growing potatoes you know in that pursuit of that i i believe that i really believe that yeah well, I you should know? get on that then. My girlfriend's from PEI, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I go to a shellfish bar, raw bar in Montreal. Montreal that you're always getting this PEI. That's right. They truck it in. Ah, oh. uh, so good. Um, so I, I, if you don't want to talk about it, we don't have to talk about it. But if you wanted to bring me through a bit of just what what ended up happening with the distribution and, and what the sort of marketing sort of plan is. Um, and again, we can cut it out if you don't want to. It, it ended up playing in about 21 cities, I think, in the United States. Um, you know, the theatrical is a tough racket right now. In general, it like, and it is. And, um, but what I felt and feel and am watching occur is, audiences are finding the film and the validation and the word of mouth that's happening with the film no ad campaign can can touch that no but it forces you to be somewhat um there are a lot of hurdles to get over these aren't jersey italians they're not mobsters uh it's a cooking movie where people throw up <laughs> uh, you know it's this there's just a whole bunch of stuff that you have to wade through. It's these aren't rich people. These aren't well, the one character is, but these are, you know, the, the I look at the town they live in and I think it's absolutely beautiful. But I'm driven by nostalgia. You know, there's a whole bunch of reasons that you that this isn't immediately accessible in the way that a Christmas Prince movie or something is. And by the way, two of my dear friends direct these movies and I love them, and my wife loves these movies, and you know. Somebody asked me to go do one and I need the money. I will probably do that. Yeah. And I won't apologize for it because I'm a director. You know, I'm not a sculptor. I'm not, I mean, I'm, this is what I do. I'm not, you know, I'm not in a garret somewhere slaving over a painting. I just, I want to raise my children and practice my craft, you know? Totally. Um, but it has been incredibly gratifying because when we do have these big screenings, the reaction, uh, is extraordinary. And the, it's almost like that when people want to talk to me about the film, they end up not wanting to talk about the film at all. They want me to listen to them tell me about their Christmas, about their family, and not just Italian Christmas, not just, sometimes not even 
<clears throat> Christmas Eve at all, or, or but about a, an experience with family and with friends and with romance and with doing something and not just, you know, doing something so that you can post on social media that you did something. Right. And I mean, it's so great when you can tap into something like that to, you know, that people can relate to. And then when they want to, you know, tell you their stories about different things, I, I think that's great. Um, so, well, you know, I really liked, you know, a couple of films. Like I see, I really liked the witch and the lighthouse, you know, um, a lot. Like I like those films a lot. And I know in the latter case, like some people don't like that. I like but the lighthouse, I, but I find both films, the way that they sit down, sit back and observe. Um, I find so compelling and, and entertaining for me. And, and it's not, I understand that's not for everybody. And, I'm not comparing my film to The Witch. I mean, I don't want to hear somebody say, oh, you, I mean, come on. Right. Um, but what I'm saying is I think that there's a – it's pointing a finger. You know, I, I think uh, – you know, we just watched Queen's Gambit and I just loved it. I thought it was wonderful. I thought there was a filmmaker. It's a filmmaker's show. I got to get into that still. If you're paying attention to it. Um, you don't necessarily learn how to play chess when you watch the show. <clears throat> but by – Actually, this show is kind of like try to keep up because mm. we're doing this chess. And it doesn't really give a shit if you get it or not. But in doing that, it makes you care. Mm. Is It is committed. From my limited perspective, I haven't played chess in decades, but I know enough about it to know, you know. I just play on my phone when I'm bored. <laughs> but it's, uh, I, you know, I loved it. The, the, the specificity of it. Yeah. And you know what, on the topic of just when people swing for the fences, like the lighthouse that I, I mean, I may not like every single one like that where they go like off into the weird, but I always want to support it. Cause I'm glad people are still making things like that, that they're just, they're taking a chance and, it, and it's hard to take a chance I, on a big I scale. Loved, I loved black Klansmen so much. That was great. Yeah. But you know why I really loved it? And, th and I mean, and God, you know, you say something like this, we're going to say that's not a nice thing to say. But I loved it because it was like a blown up student film. It's the work of a filmmaker who's still trying mm. and experimenting in a way that that people, they lose somewhere along the way. And, and, and you know, they're afraid and they and, and in many instances, rightfully so. You know, if you're if you're directing, you know, if you're directing an episode of, you know, I don't know, CSI or something. I mean, ain't nobody asking you to experiment. No. And if I had the opportunity to direct CSI, I would not experiment. I would do what I was told. I would be appropriate. I'd try to learn from it. You know, I'd try to do the best job I could. But, when, you know, when you have the chance, and that's what I loved about Black Clans, but I'm like, man, dude is still trying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I got that. I got that from that film too. And Spike always—he's honest and true with everything he does. I find. Um, so I, I thought to wrap up a bit of stuff about Feast of the Seven Fishes. Um, and uh, I have a set of questions I've been starting to ask guests, and uh, the questions sort of uh, mold and change. So there'll be a few new ones in here. Um, but first one, I would just like to ask, like, uh, so obviously, like. Everybody asks, like, oh, advice for filmmakers, right? But I uh, wonder if I could spin that on its head a bit and just ask what type of advice you were to give yourself years ago. So advice for your former self. Um, and I know we talked, touched on that subject a, a little earlier in the show, but if we could just get to that now, like advice for your former self. Oh, uh, the one I can't say because it ever gets back, I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll sound <laughs> ungracious, but, you know, Better choices in earlier relationships other than <laughs> marriage to my fabulous wife. No, um, I would have spent way more time working on writing. Um, I wish that I had um, – I remember when like the whole Sid Field thing blew up and I just didn't want to have anything to do with it. And I thought it was going to be all formulaic and everything and that was a mistake. I wish I'd – I wish that I had – focused more and drilled down more on writing when I was younger. I don't think I became a good writer until I was like 40. 
I had good ideas and ideas that I had were made into movies. Um, but I didn't reach my potential. Um, I wish that I wish I'd had a stronger mentor. Mm. I mean, once I left, uh, you know, West Virginia, Pittsburgh area and I wasn't around particularly Mike Gornick, who was uh, George Romero's DP, not to be around those people, but, but even then I wish, you know, I, I've done a, 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 on a project, uh, my one partner, Todd Livingston, I've done a lot of work with a producer named Kerry Brokaw, who I'm, I just think is one of the smartest <laughs> producers in the business. He has incredible taste. And I've, I've said to him multiple times, I, I wish to God he'd gotten in my life 20 years earlier because he is just so smart and made me a, a, a much better writer. Um, I wish that I, some of the things I hadn't turned down, mm. you know, um, I wish that I hadn't been so afraid that I was going to be labeled and I was, and mm. I, you know, and I bought into all that bullshit film school, auteur theory bullshit. And, you know, and what I should have done, I mean, listen, I can't really, you know, I, I, I got a pretty good resume. I don't have a lot to complain about. I mean, if you went to 21 year old Bob and said, here's all the stuff that you want, that list is complete. Yeah. I got thing that that person wanted. And after I got to do feast, I mean, honestly, my bucket list, there's nothing left. I have to, I had to create a new list because I finally got to make a signature film, you know, the way I wanted to make it in precisely the way I wanted to do it. And, um, you know, I wish, um, but you know, I had a pretty good run of it. I, but I do, I wish that I wish I'd been harder on myself in some areas and easier on myself in others. Um, but I'll also say that there were things that I, that I did. You can say that I'm a good writer, bad writer. You can say I'm a good filmmaker, bad filmmaker, and you can have an opinion and you can be right in any direction. But what I do feel good about is I've tried to be loyal and true and honest to my friends. I've tried to be honest in business. And I would say to people, be honest, that bullshit, that lie that you've got to somehow lie and be dishonest and deceitful to get ahead in the movie business and everybody in business is a shark. It's such utter load of horse shit, you know, yeah. um, be the person that people can count on, be candid. I think sometimes being candid has gotten me into trouble. You know, you do have to be careful in any business, particularly in the film business by telling people what they don't want to hear. When you call people on their bullshit, man, that can come back to haunt you. Mm. And it gets me a lot. Because when I see people, you know, willfully screwing up and I'll call them out on it and they don't like it because it people, you know, especially in America, we, you know, we don't like to be wrong. You may have <laughs> noticed. And we've seemed to have lost the ability to to admit mistakes and to want to grow from them. And I'm not anti-American. I don't want to get you know, anybody hating on me. I love my country. I love my countrymen. And I think we're a way more complex place than than we get painted. I totally but agree I, with that sentiment too. But yeah, no, I, I totally agree but, with what you're saying. But yeah, just being honest, true, and, and reliable, that's gotten me further, just being reliable. Yeah, and, you know, and, and accepting criticism. I, I, I wish I hadn't been so insecure when I was younger. I, I think I could have improved some things <clears throat> by accepting, you know, really listening to criticism. And now it's funny, you know, like I, I crave it mm. even name. Like I love when I get bad reviews or like, I, like I love when people are offended by feast, you'll get these people, this is horribly insulting and good Italians don't act like this. I'm like, man, I love you. I'm so happy that you hate this movie because I made this movie to piss people like you off because <laughs> I hate the way you think. And I hate the way that you try to, to make life into some perfect you know, shiny, pure thing that it is never going to be. Right. You know, so good. Dislike it. My, I'm, I'm, my work is finished here. That's a skill in and of itself. Um, next question. Great answer, by the way. Um, we often talk a lot about our, our successes in, in the business. And, and uh, you know, I think you have a ton of successes with this film even before you, I think you had successes with this film even before you even shot one second of footage. But uh, we don't talk about our failures that much, and I think we can learn from our failures a lot. And I'm wondering if you're comfortable with talking about just like a failure that sticks out in your mind, maybe what you learned from it. 
Not from this yeah. film specifically, but just if there's something that sticks out throughout your career. You know, I, I took a film for money once, but I, and I really didn't like the script at all. I mean, it was nothing. It was not what I thought I was going to be doing at that point, and I just had to do it. And I was embarrassed that I was doing it. Um, and I, I, ver- I, I profoundly disliked the film. Um, even though it won some awards and, and it was a kid's film and kids like, and I don't want to mention that. I'm not going to go there. Um, but I decided for the first time ever, when I went in to do the film, I was like, I'm the storyboarding. I'm going to see what happens. Cause I don't care. I'm going to take the handcuffs off. Shooting that film was one of the happiest experiences in my life. I had so much fun. I had a blast. And then I was embarrassed by the film. Um, and the way it was marketed a couple of times I did children's films that were marketed in such a way that people thought they were for adults and they were for eight year olds mm. and you want an ass kicking. But I ran into the star of the few mo- of the movie last year and we hadn't seen each other in a long time. And, and I apologized to him and he said, are you crazy? He said, one, I needed that money so bad because now he's really successful. And he's like, I needed the money. He goes, we had such a good time. He goes, and children love that film, you know? And I was like, oh, okay. Um, I wish that, you know, there was, a, there was a movie that I could have done and I threw a shit fit because I couldn't do it in black and white at the time. Mm. <laughs> you know, what a moron. Um, I walked away from some good relationships because I didn't want to be a producer. And now I realize that what I should have done was been the best producer I could be and work on my writing you know, I mean, there were just mistakes up and down, just not, I don't know, you know, listen, and I'm, I hope this isn't a cop out, but we used to, directors were built in the system. They may do 20, 30, 40 B movies, you know, if, before, if ever they got an A picture and eventually, you know, all their great work, you'd find out, you know, came in year 15, year 20 or whatever. Right. And. Now, you know, uh, unless you're someone like Fincher, you know, who Fincher, who had done hundreds and hundreds of commercials and videos and things and really done his pushups. And, you know, as he went into features, this isn't a guy who's only doing a movie every three years or something. Um, you know, and that's what I always admired about people like Woody Allen or Roger Corman. They just crank shit out. Yeah. And some's good, some's bad, but they, you know, they're, they're, they're working all the time. Um, not being allowed to, to practice your craft, you know, for whatever reason, year in, year out, particularly when it was so expensive to make stuff. I mean, that, that sucked. Totally. Man, honestly, like if I could, I would rather have the career where I made 20 things rather than 20 mediocre things rather than one or two like things that people love just because it's like, like you said, it's the craft. It's like the doing that's, that I care about. Yeah. And, and, um, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm just, I'm shooting all the time. And I think one out of every five things I do for the rest of my life, I'll do for free, which drives my brother, you know, my business partner, you know, it drives him crazy. But, you know, I was, how's that line? You know, I love apocalypse now. And I love that thing with Marty Sheen. Someday you know, this war is going to be over. Well, but you know, he's in the hotel and he goes in the motel room and he's like, every day I'm in here, I'm getting weaker. And every day Charlie's out in the bush getting stronger, Mm. you know, he's actually working. And, um, that's my attitude, man. I am working. You're in the bush. I'm, uh, I'm doing, how many, I just finished a documentary, two documentaries, actually short, shorter ones. And I'm finishing another one right now. And, um, I'm in post on a music video and, you know, and I've got a writing assignment, which I said I wasn't going to say it, but yes, I have a writing assignment. I'm going to write, I'm writing a screenplay and, and, um, I'm just going to work. That's great, man. And I like hearing that. Um, next thing, um, you've obviously worked in, in the industry for a long time. Is there anything that sticks out that's still kind of a mystery of what goes on or how something works in the business? Well, I always thought that there was a secret handshake and I thought that there was these things that I just didn't understand. And there isn't, no, I don't think there's any mystery. No, I think it's uh, no, I don't think at all. Um, I think it's, uh, like I said, too stupid to quit. 
Um, I think that the realization that it's just all run on fear mm. uh, is, is um, you're not going to fix it. You're not going to change it. But you're just aware of it. And what I really learned now in the wake of, you know, basically feeling like I was untouchable for years and the minute you make something that gets good reviews, what, no matter what else happens, when the industry see the, sees the reviews or they watch the film and they like it, they don't remember anything that you know happened in the intervening years and you're the guy they like again. Right. And it's just and, – and it's kind of understandable. you know. And I, I'm not – I'm honestly – if it sounds at any point like I'm being critical or dismissive of people, I'm not at all. Um, I didn't get people, that vibe. I love, I love these, I love, I love this industry and I have been blessed to make many, 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 many wonderful friends and had, you know, scores of just great, you know, sometimes temporary relationships or, you know, experiences together and got to travel and do so many things. I mean, God, can you imagine if I'd had to work for a living? <laughs> I think about <laughs> that all the time. God. Um, can, so uh, obviously you have a million things on the go, but uh, you know the thing we like to talk about a lot is like what's next or what do you want to do next af after this? Um, I I do know the one, the project I'm writing that I can't talk about yet. Um, that <laughs> Fair I, enough. That I, that I am attached to direct. Um, I'm trying to get that done. Uh, there are two other things I kind of. One thing that I really want to direct, and I finally think I've figured it out. Uh, I, I do have another script that's that's getting a little attention, and I'm going to have to probably make a decision on. But it needs a re rewrite, and I kind of have a big project I really, really want to do that I've been wrestling with for two years. Um, and then you know, some of my comic books, some of the other things have been optioned, and uh, a film I wrote is is going to be shooting this summer. And I'm, I'm excited about it, even though I'm not directing it. Um, a good friend of mine who's Canadian. Yeah. Is, yeah. Paul Johansson's directing it. Uh, who's a, an actor and director, um, and a great, he's a good friend. Um, um, you know, and then honestly, a lot of my interests now are with, um, you know, trying to restoring biodiversity on my farm and dealing with climate change and, you know, I'm calling it a farm, you know, farm, you got to have cows and stuff. We had some chickens. We don't have those and we don't live up there right now. So, you know, I'm doing permaculture installations, heirloom cider, apple orchards. And this all might sound very grand and sound like I'm some sort of a gentleman farmer in a tweed jacket, you know, pointing and telling <laughs> James, go pull those. But usually it's just me in muck boots, you know, just swirling in mud and feeling like an idiot. But, you know, I, I do believe there are a lot of things we can do to maybe – make things better on the planet. And there's a, I, I love, I so much love, um, growing things. And, and my farm was terribly impacted by strip mining and acid rain and different and invasive species. And I'm out there like Don Quixote trying to do that. And <laughs> that's my, that's my big opus. That's my big, that's my big giant movie is my farm, my, my property, my, this place in the country. Man, that's um, great. And honestly, I couldn't agree more. And I think people need more of a relationship with where food comes from to fully understand things. But that's a whole other topic of conversation. We're crazy foragers, man. I mean, we forage. We like forage for like, you know, wild mushrooms and ramps and berries. And we, I mean, we're just, we're really boring people. I mean, I'm so <laughs> not the cool, so not the cool Hollywood guy, you know. That's okay though, right? And it is honestly it's nice ago, it's man. nice to hear that though, right? That that you don't have to be at these parties doing coke all night, you know, like that you can just have a life where you make stuff and then also yeah, you like going to the country, which, you know, I I can share that sentiment too. You know, it, there was a time and a place, man. <laughs> partying and all it was all, it was fun. You can believe me. Being a single guy in Montreal directing movies was a lot of fun. Yeah. Everyone, um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm kind of a boring guy. Fair um, enough. Uh, well, um, Feast of the Seven Fishes 
is on iTunes, Amazon, basically everywhere you can get a movie streaming right now. Um, mm-hmm. Robert, I had an incredible time talking with you and, you know, I, I think we, we talked for almost two hours now and I think we could just, I could keep asking questions and learning more things, but we'll cut it short. And, um, yeah, I really enjoyed you coming on the show and I thank you very much for doing so. I feel like I owe you a big thanks just because I think this was therapy for me. I've been on this treadmill and I haven't just been sitting and talking to anybody about film and thinking about this stuff. And uh, uh, you probably had to hear me vomit. The bill will be in the mail for the therapy session. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) But tell me why. Tell me why I have problems with my mother. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Well, that'll cost. That'll be in the next session. Appreciate you. And uh, my next trip up to Tio or something, maybe we can. uh, We'll grab, grab lunch or something. We'll grab a beer, uh-huh. grab lunch. That sounds great, man. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at Lost Commentary, on Instagram at Raiders of the Lost Commentary, and like us on Facebook. I'll be back. <laughs>